you know, we, we have a, a lot of juniors here. We, we've gotten a lot of uh, data on them. We wanted to talk about that today, but, uh, you know, Scott said, no, we're not ready uh, to talk about that. We need to do more research. Uh, he doesn't make any assumptions. He, he approaches it as a scientist. He measures, observes, and uh, collects the data. So uh, that's actually what we're looking to do here in the future. We want to make sure uh, we can give some insight into how juniors are moving, uh, specifically when it comes to ground reaction forces. So. Uh, you know, welcome you guys to, uh, if you want to bring one of your juniors up uh, for an assessment to get captured, you know, let me know. Uh, we definitely want to get more data so that uh, we can all get better at what we do. Um, so I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Scott Lynn now. Uh, settle in. Uh, feel free to, to type in questions on the chat uh, if you have any questions as we go. Scott wants to make sure you can uh, ask those questions as they come up. All right. Enjoy. All right, thanks so much for having me, Dennis. Uh, it's great to be back here in the Met section, although it's a little chilly here today for me, but uh, we're doing all right here indoors. Um, I, I did the education forum for the Met section, I think it was in 2018, I believe, maybe 19, I can't remember, a couple years ago, maybe it was the last one that you guys did in person. Um, and, and it's been great, all the, all the pros that have reached out to me and the people that are um, starting to learn a lot more about the ground reaction forces. Uh, Dennis asked me how many plates or how many swing catalyst systems we have in the section and, and it's been steadily growing and I'm starting to lose track uh, of how many we have in this section. So it's, um, it's one of my favorite sections to work in and to work with because people are really into the education and people are really into getting better. Um, so really thanks so much for having me today. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so our plan for the day is I'm going to go through about a 45 minute lecture here. Um, ever since the pandemic started last uh, March, I've been doing Zoom meetings, and I'm sure you ha as have all of you, um, so many Zoom meetings, and, and I find staring at a screen for more than about 45 minutes is tough to do. Um, so I'm going to try to go for about 45 minutes of lecture here to give you some basic concepts and, and hopefully some new stuff that, that if you were a part of the last educational forum, if you've seen some of my stuff before, uh, hopefully there'll be some new stuff in here for you. Um, and then after 45 minutes, we're going to give you a little break and we're going to reorganize the cameras in the swing cat bay here um, and we're going to have some live lessons. So I think that's how you really learn. You want to see it used in action so you can see somebody swinging, see kind of what I'm seeing in the data and then how we make decisions about you know, different drills to give people or, or how we adjust uh, what we'll try to give them. So uh, and at the end, we're going to plan to have a little a little chat about uh, junior development and how uh, swing cat's going to be used. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's not a lot of data on that out in anywhere. Um, and it's interesting to me how a lot of theories get developed about junior development and how to develop athletes, um, but not a lot of them have a whole lot of science behind them. I was just reading an article last night about um, multi-sport. So, you know, everyone talks about kids should be playing multiple sports and they shouldn't specialize early. There really is no data to support that yet. Um, it's a great idea, um, but these scientists had done a big liter literature review on it um, and there really isn't a whole lot of data to support that theory. So. Um, I like to, to have data if I'm going to make any statements. And so, um, but, but hypothesizing about certain ideas is never a bad thing. So I think that's what we're going to try to do today. But with the help of the people here at the GPC, I think we're going to start to collect a lot of data and see how uh, juniors adapt and change how they move as they grow. And um, uh, as I, I've told a lot of people, my, my little baby hook there, my little baby draw that I had uh, as like a 12 and 13 year old turned into a snap hook when I grew about a foot and a half in a month and couldn't keep the ball on the planet anymore. I went from shooting 75 to 95 and that was a pretty frustrating time. And I think that's a time when we might lose a lot of golfers uh, if we don't know how to help them through those times when, uh, when the big changes happen in their bodies and how that adapts to how they swing the golf club. So that's what they're really interested in here. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there to collect some data and have some really, to really make some informed decisions. Um, but the most important thing that I've learned through my scientific journey through the golf swing um, is that everybody's different. Um, there is a great variability in any kind of biomechanical measure you'll ever uh, look at in the golf swing. So if you take 100 players and you measure anything about them biomechanically in terms of their golf swings, they're all going to do it slightly differently. Um, and this made my research pretty frustrating uh, for a long time. Uh, until I met a guy named Mike Adams, who I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with. Um, and Mike's system of putting golfers in little group it is basically what scientists would call um, cluster analysis. So you're taking a group of people and you're putting a little box around them here, here, and here to say, hey, these people have these characteristics, therefore they need to swing the club in this particular fashion. Um, and it was meeting Mike and working with Mike quite a bit that led me along the, the path that I've gone along in terms of 
doing cluster analysis. And we're going to show you a little cluster analysis that I've developed in terms of trying to determine what somebody's dominant leg is or what their strongest uh, leg or their most dominant leg is, is going to really help us determine what's going to be their optimal pattern of loading the ground. And it could be completely different to the person in your next lesson. Um, and so what are the things that determine our mechanics in our golf swing? Well, uh, from Mike Adams' tests, um, I think there's two basic things. Uh, there's your anthropometrics, which is basically how you're built. Um, so Mike does a lot of tests in terms of the length of your forearm, the length of your upper arm. Well, what determines the length of your forearm and the length of your upper arm? That's just genetics that determines that, unless there's some catastrophic injury that might affect it. But um, how you're built or your anthropometrics will affect how you move, and that's why you know, if you have a junior that grows a foot and a half in, in a couple of months, uh, their whole anthropometrics have changed, uh, which make it um, difficult to swing the same way they were swinging before because their bodies are different. Um, and that's something we got to start learning about. Um, and, and what we know from the science is, you know, the bones grow much faster than the muscles. And so when the bones grow a foot and a half or whatever, and the muscles then become really tight, short and tight, because it takes them a while to adapt and grow as well. So you get a lot of tightnesses in, in uh, juniors of that age or adolescents of that age. So that's something we need to start thinking about. And then finally, our muscle activation patterns or our, our, our uh, movement strategies. Uh, I think a lot of the way my personal golf swing works is because I grew up playing ice hockey. That was the very first athletic thing I did. Uh, so when I try to create speed with a stick in my hand, um, there's a certain pattern that, that is still in my golf swing and I can't really change um, because that's kind of my initial movement pattern that I got laid down. And obviously uh, trying to create speed with a stick in your hand and, and knives on your feet is a little different than trying to create it uh, on a different surface. So um, I create a lot of movements in my golf swing that I don't think I can get rid of because uh, I've spent 30 plus years um, doing that uh, type of movement um, playing hockey. I still well, not since the pandemic started, but I still play hockey or I did play hockey regularly. Um, and so that really bleeds over into my golf swing. And, and if you try to take away some of those movements that some people, you know, um, so basically I, I see hockey players quite a bit have a lot of glide in their golf swing or a lot of lateral motion, which a lot of people would think would be bad. Um, and if you take my lateral motion or my glide away, it's hard for me to, to swing the golf club. So um, that's something where we got to make sure that we, we, are, we understand uh, people's fundamental movement strategies and how they learn to create speed over time. Um, and then we also got to understand their anthropometrics. Um, and I think your fundamental movement strategies will enter into what becomes your dominant leg is what we're going to talk about later. So if I move in a certain way my whole life, that'll affect how my muscles developed and what my what leg is stronger than the other or or more dominant than the other one. And that will really affect how I use the ground uh, in my golf swing. Um, and I always make the statement that, that humans are, are messy. Um, I was a uh, very rear leg dominant or trail leg dominant golfer for a while. And then I had an injury playing ice hockey where I kind of messed up my ankle, uh, which made me have to adapt for a little while. And then there's some scar tissue that develops there and I can't quite load the same way I did before. Um, so we have some physical messiness, all of us from past injuries or different movements that we've done. Uh, we also have mental messiness. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work uh, quite a few times with Matt Kuchar. Um, and Matt Kuchar has some mental messiness when it comes to missing the ball left. So he could be working on something that's gaining him tons of speed and he's hitting it really well for a really long period of time. And if one ball goes left, it triggers those memories of when he lost his card by hitting the ball left and he aborts mission. He stops doing whatever it is that he was doing before. And I've started to tell coaches now when I'm working with a really good player uh, and they hit on the plate before I look at the swing cat data, before I look at the launch monitor data, I look at their face to see what they what they're thinking from that strike. And if you see them go, ooh, that was pretty good, um, then, you know, that's a, then you're like, okay, we might be on the right track here. But if you see them kind of grimace, um, it may not be the best thing for them. Um, and even though the shot might look good to you and it might, you know, the numbers might be great, if they're not comfortable making that motion, um, then, you know, obviously that's not going to work under pressure or on the first tee the next day. Uh, so, so working out that messiness, I think, is the job of the golf coach to figure out the messiness of every single golfer in front of you and try to make it work the best for them. Um, and, and the best coaches that I've seen do this might give the opposite lesson in consecutive lessons. So one lesson, they might be trying to introduce more horizontal motion or more glide. The next motion, they might be, the next lesson, they might be trying to get more vertical. The next lesson, more torque, you never know. Um, who's going to be in front of you and what particular elements they're going to need. 
So the really important thing is we can't teach the same mechanics to every single golfer. And that if we do that, we're just guessing and we're, we're hoping that, that what we're teaching is going to work for that golfer. So you have to have a system to assess. Uh, and that's where I think using the force plates, we're developing a lot more tests and a lot more assessments uh, that can help you really understand that human standing in front of you so you can help them the best you possibly can. Um, so just a review for uh, those of you who haven't done any uh, biomechanics training before or any of the swing catalyst certifications. Um, the most important of Newton's laws when it comes to ground reaction forces, because it's called a reaction force, is Newton's third law, which is for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So that means if I push down and into the ground a certain direction, the ground's going to push back and up in the opposite direction of how I pushed into it. And that's how we really have to understand that. And it gets confusing at times, but we have to understand that concept if we're going to understand what these force plates are telling us. Um, and so it takes external, if we talk about uh, one of Newton's other laws, which is his first law, which tells us that we need um, forces to create motions. Um, and so, you know, this object will stay here forever unless there's a force applied to it. And so uh, we need forces to create motions. Forces always come before motions. And as a golfer, the only thing external to your body, and, and those forces have to come from external to the object to create motions. Um, and as a golfer, the only thing external we're connected to are our feet on the ground and our hand on the club. And so because the club's free to move in space, it really doesn't push back on us. And, um, and so it's really our feet on the ground that help determine how we move. Um, and, and also because it is a reaction for us, you know, our brains can think of moving in a certain place and the ground will react to that. So I always get questions from people, is it the ground that creates the motion or the motion that creates the ground forces? And, and my answer is always yes, it's both. Um, we can think of moving in a certain way that is going to change how the ground, what, what forces the ground feels, or we can think of pushing into the ground differently to change our motions. Both of those things work uh, back and forth together that you can't separate one from the other. Um, but I know that golf things would be impossible without our ability to push into the ground because that's what gives us the external forces that allows us to move our body no matter whether we're trying to move. And, and that's where um, I always show this video here uh, where the guy is swinging on the ice. So swinging on the ice takes away a lot of our ability to push into the ground because a lot of the things we do to the ground with our feet require shearing forces. So side to side and forward and back shearing forces, which require friction, right? We require friction between our feet and the ground to create those shearing forces to allow our bodies to move. And you'll see if we don't have that friction, uh, some strange things happen. And so you'll see here this guy, I'm sure most of you have seen this that if we try to, and uh, I drove by a couple of ponds on my way up here from JFK that uh, looked like they were starting to freeze. So there might be some people out there doing this today. Um, so you can see what's really interesting that most people see when they watch this video is that trail foot slips backwards away from the ball in transition and the lead foot slips forwards towards the ball in transition. Uh, and that's the way our feet are pushing into the ground to create rotation. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and that's what most people see and they see them fall down and crack through the ice and they laugh. And um, that's the interesting part to them. Uh, but to me, what I, what my brain or what my eye went to directly when I first saw this was where his low point is in this golf swing. Uh, so you can see that he hits it about a foot fat, uh, which makes a ton of sense if we understand the kinetic sequence, uh, which is something we've developed or understood based on using the force plate. So using the force plate started to uh, allowed us to see this kinetic sequence, which is the order in which we're using ground reaction forces in the golf swing. Um, because, uh, and we'll get to the kinetic sequence later, but the order of the kinetic sequence is basically uh, the first force we use in our golf swing is a horizontal or a gliding force. The second force we use is the rotational force or the torque. And the third force we use is the vertical force. And obviously in the torque component where he's trying to spin, where the feet are moving forward and backwards, that's where his feet slipped. And so obviously his feet slipped, they're no longer on the ground anymore. He can't produce the vertical force, which is a big club shallower. And so since the vertical force can't happen anymore because his feet aren't on the ground, he can't shallow that thing out and he hits it about a foot and a half fat. And so uh, adding vertical force to your uh, golfers who may be chunking it uh, or hitting behind it quite a bit uh, is a good way to shallow it out and, and try to have them uh, not hit it quite so fat all the time, uh, which is a big problem. So um, really cool video there. Obviously there's some uh, humor to it, but also uh, we can learn a lot from, uh, from this guy who decided to go out there and try to hit one off the ice. And so two things we, we can see from the, the animation here. Uh, this is an animation created from um, in our lab or in my lab at Cal State Fullerton in uh, Orange County, California. So there we have a 3D motion capture system that circles the lab and it's uh, 
all collected in the same space or all uh, coordinated with the force forces. So the forces and the, the motions are all calibrated in the same space. Um, Swing Catalyst has been working on creating something like this in a commercial product for a while, and we're pretty close. Um, we have a markerless motion capture system that will be coming out uh, in the very near future. Um, and it's gonna be all calibrated in the same space as the force plate. So using the Swing Catalyst system, you'll be able to get animations like this, where we can see the person in the club moving in space, and we can see these ground reaction force vectors dancing around in space. Because it's really important where those forces are acting relative to where the body is in space, because that's going to help us understand uh, how we're creating movement. Uh, but the two things I want you to, to realize from this, or to watch from this, uh, from this animation is you can see if we look at him from the front and he gets to the top of his backswing, you can see that both of these forces are kind of tilted towards the target. And these green vectors or these forces are the reaction forces. So at this particular point in the golf swing, when we get to the top of our backswing, we're actually pushing down and away from the target and the ground is pushing us up and towards the target. And that's going to create our gliding motion or our horizontal motions in the golf swing. Everybody does it. Uh, everybody has some glide in their golf swing. It's just how much and for how long do we produce that gliding force that's different. Um, but everybody around the top of their backswing is gonna have some form of that horizontal motion or that gliding force. So for those of us who may have thought that, that a glide or a sway is a bad thing in the golf swing, maybe for some people I would agree it 100% is, but everybody has some. It's impossible to swing the club without having some horizontal force or some gliding force. Um, and so that's something that we can see if we look at the body in the, in the frontal plane here or from the front. But if we look from the side, you can see as we get to the top of our backswing, we have those forces crossing or creating kind of a V or an X shape. Um, and the crossing of those forces means that at this particular point, you could see in transition, the vector coming out of my trail foot is acting forwards or towards the ball. And so that means that my trail foot is actually trying to slide backwards or away from the ball to create that reaction force. And so if I'm moving, if I'm trying to rotate, my right hip forward towards the ball as I would in a downswing, my trail foot is actually trying to pull back away from the ball to create that reaction force that's pushing my hip forwards. So basically we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but in the backswing, um, your trail foot actually pushes towards the ball, which creates the reaction force shoving your trail hip away from the ball, and your lead foot does the opposite. It's trying to drag away from the ball, which creates the reaction force shoving your lead hip towards the ball, which creates that rotation of the pelvis away from the ball. And then in the downswing, we do the opposite. Trail foot's actually pulling away from the ball, which creates a reaction force shoving our trail hip forwards. Uh, and the lead foot is actually pushing towards the ball, which creates a reaction force shoving our lead hip backwards. And so most people have seen somebody in the in their downswing have their trail foot slip on them and it always slips backwards away from the golf ball. Uh, so that's the way that your foot is pushing into the ground in the downswing. You're actually trying to drag your trail foot away from the ball. And for those people who use their trail foot quite a bit to drag it away from the ball, if there's not enough pressure on it, if we're not pushing it into the ground enough, then that foot might slip. You also see quite a bit now, a lot of golfers like Matt Wolf and Lexi Thompson, where their lead foot jumps and moves away from the ball in the downswing. So we have that kind of backwards movement of the lead side. Well, obviously to move your body backwards like that, you'd have to be pushing forwards into the ground to create that reaction force pushing backwards. So this is something that you have to swirl around in your head for a while. It's, it's very confusing for some people, um, but the way that you can feel it is to try to pull them in the opposite direction. So we're gonna talk about some ways I use to train these ground reaction forces. And one of the best ways is something I call reactive neuromuscular training where I try to push you in one direction and you have to try to fight me and push back in the opposite direction. And that's when you can really feel what your feet are doing uh, to the ground uh, in the golf swing. But we'll get to get, to get to that in a second. So first we're gonna go over some swing catalyst screens here uh, and talk about some of the data that we get. So the first force I always look at is the horizontal force or swing catalyst calls it the right left force. So the force acting away or towards the target. Um, and you'll always see uh, in somebody's golf swing a positive spike somewhere around the top of the backswing, and then a negative spike somewhere around impact. So you can see this double spike, one positive and one negative. And that's normal, that's what we should be seeing in a golf swing, and what does that mean? What that means is a positive spike, anytime you see a positive spike in the horizontal or this purple graph on the swing catalyst, um, you're gonna see a force vector or two force vectors acting towards the target. So that means the golfer is pushing down and away from the target and creating a reaction force acting towards the target, which is gonna create some translation or some movement of the pelvis towards the target. 
everybody has some, just depending on how much. Uh, what we have in the Swing Catalyst software too that I'm really a big fan of are these tour average bands. I'm not sure if you guys can see that on your Zoom meeting, but there's a black band here that starts here and goes down to here. Uh, the middle of that black band is the tour average. The top of that black band is the tour average plus one standard deviation. And the bottom of that, that black band is the tour average minus one standard deviation. I think this is really good to have this type of information. I mean, a lot of people get, you know, they're like, oh, why are we comparing ourselves to tour players? Like, tour players are so different. Uh, and I agree, tour players are different. But the only reason that we keep those things on there is to tell you how much is a lot and how much is a little of that particular measure. Because if without that on there, if I told you, hey, you got 24% of your body weight in horizontal force acting during the downswing, you're probably going to ask me, uh, all right, how much is that? Is that a lot? Is that a little? Um, the analogy I always give people, uh, Swing Catalyst is a Norwegian company. And uh, the first time I went there, uh, I checked into my hotel when I first arrived. And I was, it was late at night, so I thought I'd go down to the bar and have a beer before, before I went to bed. I went down, ordered a beer from the, from the bartender, and they said it was, I, don't know, I can't remember what it was, maybe 200 kroner or whatever. And I was like, okay, how much is that? 200 kroner, is that? five American dollars? Is that 10 American dollars? Is that 300 American dollars? I have no idea. Um, and so having some way of, of understanding um, how much is a little and how much is a lot or what that measure actually means uh, is really powerful for a coach using this. So that's why we like those tour average bands. And, and we've been lucky enough with Swing Catalyst. The company's been around since 2008. So we have a lot of uh, professionals, a lot of PGA Tour players in our database. We have some LPGA Tour players, not enough. We're hoping to get a lot more um, to start to, to understand the LPGA Tour averages as well. But that's still, that black band just gives us an idea how much is a lot and how much is a little. Um, and so uh, the positive force, again, you can see this particular one. I believe this is Justin Rose here. Um, he has a horizontal force that's above the tour average plus one center deviation. So he's creating a significant amount of horizontal force towards the target. But if you'll notice in Justin Rose here, the area under this positive force is pretty close to matching the area under this negative force. You can see that this little triangle here is pretty close to the same area as that little triangle there. Because what's really important with the horizontal force is that we break all the energy that we put into the club. Because you'll see a lot of amateurs who produce a lot of horizontal force and you get that really saggy lead side where their lead side kind of bows out. Um, that, that's pretty inefficient because you're creating a lot of force, but you're not breaking it and transferring it into the club to create that energy. Because um, in the end, that's what we want to do, right? Our body motions aren't important if we don't get that energy into the club um, and then obviously transfer it into the ball. Uh, so it's really important that we have a negative force coming into impact. And I call this the breaking force. And so you'll see as I come into impact, that force goes negative or it goes down to the negative area. And you can see Justin Rose produces 24% positive and 25% negative of his body weight in breaking force. So he's breaking pretty much all the energy that he's putting in there. Uh, to know for sure, you'd have to have the area under this curve, which will be coming pretty soon. We'll be able to get that information from our algorithms uh, soon in Swing Catalyst. But for now, uh, just understanding the peaks gives us some idea of what's going on there. Um, and so you can see the negative force. What you want to see on the negative force is the body pushing down and towards the target and the ground pushing back up and away from the target. And so that's going to be our breaking force. We're going to try to stop that linear momentum that we put into the system and transfer it to the club. And I think a really good, um, uh, a really good idea for most people is to have those two forces relatively matching. Um, I actually like less, hor less breaks and more, or less gas and more breaks. That's a better problem in my mind because then at least you're getting whatever energy you put in transferred into the club. Um, but you'll find a lot of amateurs that put in a lot of gas, a lot of horizontal force, but then don't have the brakes to stop it. And that's when we get a really saggy lead side and generally costs them a ton of speed and a ton of efficiency in their swings. I've really got interested in this breaking force and how it's produced recently because uh, we've been able to measure Kyle Berkshire. Uh, who is the current world long drive champion, because I believe they canceled it last summer. Um, and he has the most horizontal breaking force that, I've ever, that we've ever measured on the swing catalyst plate. So you can see he's able to produce 37% of his body weight uh, in horizontal force breaking, which is uh, the highest magnitude of horizontal breaking force that I've seen in all the people that I've measured on the plate, whether amateurs, long drive people, um, or PGA Tour players or anyone. And since this guy is the fastest swinger in the world, um, I think there's something to that. Uh, we've also seen some, uh, got somebody being a little loud out there. Um, we've also seen some people um, or some uh, 
PGA Tour players, or even you know, anecdotal examples of where braking forces could uh, really help us um, create more speed. So I've done some work recently with Brian Gay, uh, who works with Joe Mayo, um, and we were able to measure him several times. Brian Gay obviously um, has been notoriously kind of one of the slower swingers on speed uh, on tour, but he no longer is that. Uh, and so this is a, a video or a, a swing catalyst capture of him. I think this was around 2014 or 15. And you can see that he has a big, massive horizontal spike positive. So that the horizontal spike positive is at the tour average or above, but you can see, so he has 24% push off. So he's pushing off and creating horizontal motion towards the target around the same level as Justin Rose does. But remember, Justin Rose created 24% or 25% breaks. And here, Brian Gay is only creating 9% breaks. So he's putting a ton of energy in the system, but it's not, he's not breaking it and transferring it to the club. And you can see that equals 105 mile an hour club speed, which is uh, not so good for a PGA Tour player. Uh, and so Brian's been working on a whole bunch of different things in his swing. Um, I don't think you know, they've done anything specific to work on breaking forces, but whatever they've done um, has resulted in more braking forces. So you can see this was Brian um, from about a year ago now. I believe this was collected in February of 2020, uh, just before the tournament at Riviera in Los Angeles. Um, and you can see now he's putting in 12% horizontal force and braking 19%. So you see he's increased his braking force by a lot and he's actually decreased how much horizontal force or the peak of his horizontal force is just on a lot longer. So you can see that area under the curve is still quite a bit, um, but it, the peak actually isn't that much, but he's spiking that braking force and turning on those brakes very quickly and transferring that energy to the club. And you can see that now, in this particular capture, he's up to 112. Uh, this was done indoors. So generally indoors, people sometimes swing a little bit slower as they're kind of, um, they, they can't quite let it go the way they can outdoors. Uh, I know that uh, Joe has gotten him up significantly higher than that, closer to 115 and between 115 and 120, I think he's had him at. So, uh, and this breaking force, I think is a big reason why. Um, and so if you have one of those, one, an amateur player who you can see that saggy lead side where you can draw a curved line around their leg, uh, around their lead side as they come into impact, I think you can kind of assume if you don't have a force plate that, that there might be a lacking of braking forces there. And so you got to teach them how to post up and break through that lead side a lot better. Uh, and we have a lot of good drills to try to do that. We'll, we'll give you some of those in a second. Uh, so next force we're going to talk about is our torque force, which is uh, that rotational force. And so you can see in, in the torque force, the yellow graph here, we have a negative spike somewhere around the middle of the backswing. And so remember in the negative spike, that's our body trying to produce uh, back swing rotations of our, of our pelvis. And so you can see the force vector coming out of the trail foot has kind of a lean backwards away from the ball. And so that means the trail foot is shoving towards the ball and creating that backwards vector, pushing the trail hip backwards. That's actually a really good cue to give people if you want them to get a little less glidey off the ball. You see a lot of amateurs that'll kind of glide off it and, and move laterally off the ball if you want to get more rotation to teach them to try to shove their trail foot towards the ball. And if I try to shove my trail foot towards the ball, that kind of activates the muscles a little better and shoves that trail hip backwards. It might make them a little more rotational, a little less glidey um, on the backswing, which can be a good thing for some players. Uh, and then you can see the lead hip or the lead side, that force vector is acting forwards. So that means the trail or the lead foot is to try to pull back away from the ball, which creates that reaction force shoving the left hip forwards. So that's the backswing rotation. Obviously that blip is small because our backswing rotations happen at a relatively uh, slow speed. So we're not trying to rotate off the, ball, off the ball super fast. So there's a tiny little blip of backswing rotation, a negative blip there. And then when we go to the positive side here, the big positive one in the downswing, that's when we're doing the opposite, right? The trail foot's trying to pull back away from the ball, creating the reaction force acted forward. That's gonna take my right hip and shove it towards the ball. And then the lead foot is pushing towards the ball, which creates a reaction force acting away from the ball, shoving my uh, lead hip or my left hip back away. And so that opposite push forward and backward push uh, of your feet is what creates that torque. And so to help drive this message home, of the dis difference between horizontal force and torque or rotational force. I always show this video that, um, I forget exactly who it was that posted this video on social media a long time ago. Um, but I would argue that one of these two players is kind of a, a predominantly horizontal player. And one of these players is predominantly a torque player. And you gotta decide who's who based on what I just told you. So let's have a look at this video here. So these, this video is done by standing on two foam rollers. 
And so obviously a foam roller, if you push side to side, it might allow you to push back. So if I push in this direction on a foam roller, it's gonna give me that horizontal force and gonna allow me to swing the golf club. But if I push forward and backwards on these foam rollers, they're just gonna slip and fall down. And so obviously the guy in the yellow shirt there is swinging more horizontally. He needs a little bit of work on his brakes because you see he kind of walks towards the target. But this girl is more of a rotational player and you can see that back foot really trying to push backwards. It slips out from under her. The lead foot goes forward. It slips out from under her and, he fall, and she falls. Um, so obviously that's a terrible drill for her because um, the first goal of your brain is to keep you upright and not fall down and hurt yourself. And so if you get her to get better at that drill, she's gonna, you're going to take away her torque. She's going to stop pushing her feet in the ground in a way that's trying to rotate um, and try to stay upright. And that'll take away probably her dominant power source or her dominant ground reaction force, um, which will probably kill her golf swing. So not a very good drill for her. I don't know if that's a good drill for a glider or not. I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure, but probably not the greatest either for them. Um, but that just gives you an idea of, so if you don't have a swing catalyst and you have some junior players, you want to decide whether they're predominantly horizontal or torque, uh, maybe you can get some foam rollers to try it out. Just make sure their uh, insurance slips or their liability slips are all signed before you do that because it looks a little dangerous to me. All right, and the third force we're gonna talk about is our vertical force. And this is one we've learned a lot about recently with the emergence of players literally jumping in their downswings. So we got Justin Thomas and Lexi Thompson and a whole bunch of players now who are their feet, uh, Matt Wolf, are literally off the ground as they're making contact with the ball. And so if we're jumping or getting our feet to come off the ground, we're pushing straight down and creating that vertical force uh, that lifts us off the ground. Um, and this is something that I've seen in a lot of really long drivers, a lot of vertical forces. Um, and the one uh, animation I have here on the left uh, is a long drive kid from California that I measured in my lab uh, several years ago. And he had the most uh, vertical force uh, on his left leg because we have a two plate system, two plate, uh, two force plate system in my lab. And he had 1788 newtons of vertical force on his only his left leg. Um, when he came to swing in my lab, and that was the most we'd ever measured. Uh, if you remember the previous image or the previous animation was of Kevin Chappell, and you saw the size of this arrow is correlated to the amount of force. And in Kevin Chappell, that force only came up to about his shoulder. Uh, this one goes kind of twice above his head. But again, with these Newtons, 1,788 Newtons, um, how much is that? Um, it's kind of like my Norwegian kroner story. I don't really know. How much is 70? Is that a lot? Is that a little? I don't really know. Uh, so being able to put it in a way like Swing Catalyst does, where you have the tour average and you can see how much that is, um, it, it really gives you a chance to understand the magnitudes and how much is a lot and how much is a little. That 1,788 newtons is a lot. Because if we, new, if we use uh, Newton's second law, we find out that that's actually 182 kilograms or approximately 400 pounds of vertical force into this, his one leg uh, in his downswing. So uh, those long drive uh, swingers and, and the PGA Tour players who are, who are hitting it really far are putting a lot of force into the ground. And that's why, um, you know, having uh, the ability to put those forces in the ground like Bryson is doing just doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes from putting a lot of time in the gym and, and being able to handle those large loads to allow us to, to hit the ball as far as, as they do. And so that's why, you know, most uh, or pretty much all um, long swingers or people that are hitting the ball a long ways uh, are, are using are in the gym and, and doing a lot of work to, to handle these large forces that it takes to, to create those high club head speeds. Um, one of the most vertical force we've measured on our single plate system, our, our uh, swing catalyst system is at Liam Mucklow's facility in Canada. Uh, he measured Justin James, the world long drive champion, and he had 301% body weight. Um, so I would say that he's probably 250 pounds, so if you multiply 250 times three, he's getting 750 pounds or so of vertical force off both feet, uh, which is the most that I've seen on the swing catalyst plate. Um, and obviously that's why um, he's always up there in the world long drive championships as well. Creates a ton of vertical force uh, in his golf swing. Uh, and this is something that when I first started working for Swing Catalyst, uh, most of the, or all the long hitters that I'd seen on it, all the, the long drive people, all the long hitters on the PGA Tour had a ton of vertical force. And so I started to kind of say, hey, I think, you know, to hit it really long ways, I think you need a lot of vertical force. And, and I think that's, that's a wrong direction to go. I think I made a mistake by, by saying that um, because um, inevitably, whenever I say something like that in the next week, two weeks, month, I always tend to find somebody who hits it a long way or who does something really well and doesn't do what I just said that everybody does. So it's never true that every 
good golfer does X or everybody does whatever. That's never true. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't do it and still hits it really well. And that's why it's really important to work out the messiness of every human being. Uh, so we learned that from Gary Woodland. Gary Woodland is one of the longest players out on the PGA Tour. And you can see he's got tons of torque. Uh, Middle of the tour average horizontal, but a tiny little blip of vertical. So he doesn't even get to the tour average of vertical, can still hit it a really long ways. Um, and so vertical isn't the optimal thing for everyone. Um, I've done some work recently with uh, Francesco Molinari and James Richard in, in Los Angeles. Francesco's just moved to LA. Um, and I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago at, at the Masters, there was a video of him trying to work on that vertical force. And, and so he went down that road and you think it might have caused an injury in him. Um, and so we're now working on the torque road with him and he seems to be having a lot more success uh, with that and his body's feeling a lot better. So um, it's never true that one force is optimal for everyone. And so if you're just working on vertical with everyone, um, uh, that may be a, a mistake. And, and I think if you're working with Gary Woodland, trying to put more vertical in there is probably a mistake. Um, and it was with Francesco Molinari, we believe as well. So uh, that's something we got to think about. So you got to work out the messiness of every single golfer uh, to allow them to perform optimally. I've also been looking a lot at vertical force as uh, you can see that in, you know, Justin James and a lot of people, there's one spike of vertical that happens somewhere in the late downswing. Uh, Justin James has it happening super early. Um, but, and so that's the most efficient way to have it. If you looked at some of the best vertical jumpers in the world, they would have just one big spike and then they jump up in the air. When you have multiple spikes or kind of bumping around, that's kind of an inefficient way to create force. And, and one thing we see quite a bit recently are these double spike verticals where you can see this is Ian Poulter and you can see he has 171% of his body weight in vertical force or 341 pounds of vertical force acting after the ball's gone. So after you've hit the ball and the ball's gone, you're in eccentric deceleration mode. So your brain is like, the job is done. I need to slow this club down and relax and uh, everything's over. And eccentric means all the muscles are stretching and trying to slow down or decelerate the motion of that club. And if you put yourself in a position where you have a massive spike of vertical force while your body's in eccentric deceleration mode, I think that's kind of dangerous. Um, and I saw this in Ian Poulter's swing. Um, and that's something that I think, I don't know if you guys have followed anything with Ian Poulter, but he was having some back issues. Uh, they started, I think, in Scotland uh, last fall. Uh, and he had some, he had to withdraw from the Houston Open, I believe, and then, um, you know, had some back issues through the Masters. And so I've been working with him recently, trying to get him to uh, get rid of that second spike, because I think that is something that over time will build up. Uh, and create injury. Uh, one thing that has helped, there's lots of different ways why people might have that, that second spike vertical, uh, but one thing that's helped him is to uh, get his chin up a little bit more. Because you can see here, he keeps his head down so long that that, that shoulder runs into it and finally gives him that kind of vert vertical jump that gets him out of his posture. Uh, so one cue that has helped with a lot of people didn't help a lot with Ian because his patterns are so laid down, but uh, is to get them to release earlier. So if you think, I always tell people, for those people who know the swings like an Annika Sorenstam or a David Duval type finish where you try to get them to turn their everything release towards the target super early, uh, that can help um, get rid of that second spike. But that's something that if you have a force plate, you can try a whole bunch of things and then test it and see if it gets rid of that second spike. Um, and that's something we've been working on with him to try to keep him healthy and get rid of some of those, those back issues. So um, definitely putting a lot of force through the body after the job is done when you're in eccentric deceleration mode is dangerous. Uh, and I would equate this to like a baseball pitcher. There are, you rarely see a baseball pitcher get hurt before here. After that ball's gone, this is where all the damage happens. So that's where we need to train ourselves in deceleration. Uh, and that's where Dr. Tom House and the work he does at USC and LA is really important with throwers. Most of the stuff he does is on that breaking or deceleration force, making sure we can eccentrically control ourselves, and, and putting a massive spike of vertical force through our body at that time uh, probably isn't that efficient. Um, and so I have seen multiple examples of this where that second spike has, has built up over time and created back problems in people or some kind of pain in people. And that's something that we can use the force plate to help try to get rid of. Uh, and we've been working with Ian on that as well. Um, so when I talk to golf, golf instructors about using our plate in, 
in golf instruction, uh, I think the best analogy that I've come across is one that uh, one of our ambassadors in Sweden, Eric Blomqvist, uh, provided to me. Uh, so he said, you know, it's kind of like the, the roadies, if we ever have concerts again, <laughs> that come on to a stage to, to retune the instruments after another band has left. So if you ever go to those concerts where there's multiple bands, one band finishes and they leave. And what happens? All the roadies come in to retune every, all the instruments to the new band because they need a different combination of, I forget what the three things are on, a, on an amplifier, treble, bass, and whatever that third thing is. Um, so for me to sound good, it's going to be different than for you to sound good. So when one band's on there and they're tuned perfectly to that band and they leave, the next band comes on, we got to retune those things to make sure all those dials are set perfectly to make the next band sound good. And that's exactly what we're doing with ground reaction forces. We're trying to tune those forces to the player in front of us. Um, and when I first started teaching this, most golf instructors assumed that if I just cranked up all three of them, everybody would hit it great. So I just like, turned all those levers to hunt to 10, um, everybody would hit it great. Well, that's not the case. I've actually seen a lot that if we turn down one force and increase another force, the golfer hits it better. Whereas if we just crank them all up, sometimes that doesn't equal good, good things in, in golf swings. And so tuning the forces to every single person is what's important. And so a good golf instructor using a ground reaction force plate or working with a golfer needs to have tools in their toolbox where they can adjust each of these forces. So we gotta have some tools to turn up torque and turn down torque, turn up horizontal, turn down horizontal, turn up the horizontal braking force. I've yet to have to try to turn down somebody's horizontal braking force, but I'm sure that probably is the case with somebody out there. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, and then somebody to turn up vertical and turn down vertical. So if you have those tools in your toolbox, you can basically adjust any uh, force there is and hopefully, and then obviously what you do is once you adjust the forces, you have them hit it. And so what does the guy who's tuning the guitar do? He strums the guitar and if it sounds good, then we're good. If they hit it and the launch monitor tells you good things, then it looks like we're doing something good. If it still doesn't sound good, they still don't hit it well as you adjust the forces, then tweak it a little more. Maybe we need more vertical, a little less torque. Give that a shot. Um, so as long as you have the tools to move these things around, uh, you can use these, these plates and these ground reaction force plates effectively. And so I think a really good way to train people to use ground reaction forces is to use a concept called reactive neuromuscular training. Uh, John Dunnigan calls this, whoever does the work does the learning. Um, and so you'll see here that uh, above uh, the top video there is of RG3 at the NFL Combine, uh, Robert Griffin III. When he was doing his horizontal uh, or his long jump, his standing long jump, his knees kind of clang together. And I think it was the Reds, or not the Redskins, the football team, I guess they're called now, um, that drafted him. And apparently they didn't see that. Because we know that if your knees clang together when you're trying to do any kind of activity, that's a really big injury risk. And uh, ooh, getting late here. Um, and so to, to fix that, what we want to do is pull the knee in more. So I've seen a lot of trainers in the gym kind of push their knees out for them, but that means they're not doing the work. So you want to get them to do the work to, and so that would be, I'd put a band around their knee and pull their knee in more and get them to push back against me like this uh, trainer here is doing. Uh, and that's a good way to activate the muscles to stop that knee from caving in. And so it's the same concept when we're trying to do, teach people to use ground reaction forces. So if I want them to produce more horizontal push off force or more positive horizontal force, I'll put a band around their pelvis, and as they get to the top of the backswing, I'm gonna pull them away from the target. And if they're not able to push back and create horizontal force, I'm gonna pull them off balance and might pull them off, uh, off the plate, which is good, because then they'll learn how to push that foot in the ground and create that horizontal force. And then the opposite, if I wanted to create some more breaking forces, which happened, you know, you saw in Kyle Berkshire, it was right around um, late downswing. I would get them into the late downswing, and then I would pull them towards the target. So if I put that horizontal force pulling them toward the target and they're not able to break, I'm gonna pull them over and they're gonna to fall towards the target. Um, that's good, they'll learn something. They'll learn how to push that lead foot in the ground, post up through that lead leg and create more breaking force. So having a band or some kind of a, a rubber band or some kind of stretchy band around is a really good way to, to help people learn how to produce ground reaction forces. This is Mike Adams. He developed this torque drill um, where you have a band uh, attached behind them and you have that attached on the right thigh and they have to kind of push to create that rotational force. So obviously if I want to stretch that band, I got to learn to push my trail foot backwards into the ground, which is going to shove my lead hip forwards um, and create that or move that, uh, that stick and allow it to smash that uh, boxing glove that Mike has there. Um, but what you'll notice as he was doing this is the, the stick kind of comes away from his lead side. So this is a, a predominantly rear leg dominant torque drill. Um, and so you can adjust this if you want to create more torque from the, from the front leg by just adjusting where the stick is and where the resistance is. So if you understand ground reaction forces, 
pull it, putting the stick behind their pelvis and having the, the stick attached to the front side of that, uh, of that golf club allows us to produce some uh, front leg dominant torque. So this is, for, if you do this exercise properly, you're learning to push your lead foot towards the ball and create the stretch in that band that pushes that trail hit or the lead hip backwards. So that's a good front leg dominant uh, torque cue. And so understanding what their dominant leg is in producing torque uh, will help you determine which exercise would be most optimal for them or which cue, cueing strategy would be most optimal for them. Uh, then we have, whoops, uh, vertical force cues. There's lots of different ways to create vertical force. If you wanna create it off the lead leg, you wanna have that band under their lead foot and around their lead shoulder and have them just squat down and then push up and stretch that band. That creates uh, a lot of vertical force through the lead side, uh, but not everyone creates vertical force through their lead side. What we've learned through using force plates is some people create vertical force through their trail side, which seems weird. I mean, I think a lot of people think that you just transfer your pressure to your lead side and that's where all your vertical comes from, but that's not true with every player. Uh, so sometimes we're gonna wanna create uh, vertical force through the trail side. So here's Ben Shear working with one of Debbie Doniger's students. I'm not sure if Debbie's on the, the call uh, today, or, but you can see that he's pushing down and towards that trail side, and she's trying to push up through that right foot and to create uh, right foot vertical force, which some players need. Um, I've found a lot of players, or a couple of players recently that are really using that trail side to create vertical force and torque, and so you gotta keep their pressure back and keep them more on their trail side longer. Uh, one of the players that I've been working with recently that, that was the case was uh, Austin Ekro with the Oklahoma State golf team. Uh, he's a very trail leg dominant golfer. Uh, if you get him transferring his pressure forward too quickly, he has that right foot slip all the time uh, and creates some wild golf shots for him. And so you can see here, most people would be teaching him to try to get off that lead side, right? Get up on that toe, get onto your lead side more. And if you do that, you're taking away one of his dominant power sources, which is his right leg pushing hard into the ground. Uh, so he's one of the, the uh, very rear leg dominant golfers that I've been working with recently. And, and hopefully we can get him out on the PGA Tour soon so that we can uh, start seeing some different swings and understanding that that could work. Because uh, for those of us who just teach everyone to try to get off the right side and get to the left side, that could be hurting some of your players. Definitely something that hurts uh, Austin Eckroat. Uh, last thing we're gonna finish with here, uh, well, not quite the last thing, we've got a couple more things to do here, is our kinetic sequence that we talked about before. So if you see how these ground reaction forces peak, this is Justin Rose here. You can see I have this force positioned at the top of his torque, and you can see that his horizontal has already peaked and his vertical is on the way up. So the kinetic sequence that we see in 99.9%, .9%, I would say, of really good golfers uh, is horizontal force first, torque second, and vertical force third. And I think that's something that's one of the closest things to a universal truth that I've seen in the golf swing uh, biomechanically. And so that's something that if you have a brand new golfer who really doesn't even understand how to create, create a golf swing motion, getting them to understand that sequence. So a little shift, a little turn, and then kind of a, a jumper going up. I think uh, VJ Trollio uh, down in Alabama calls it uh, surf, spin, and stick or something like that. Um, and so he gets his juniors trying to work on that kind of sequence, which, which I think for beginning golfers could be really good because that's something that we see in 99% you know, of, of, of good swingers. Uh, the timing of the forces is super important. What you'll see is the horizontal force is going to peak somewhere around the top of the backswing, either just before or just after the top of the backswing. Your torque is going to peak somewhere around left arm parallel, either just before or just after. And your vertical force is going to peak somewhere around club parallel in the downswing. We generally don't want it after club parallel in the downswing. We want it before that. And the vertical force peak, if you saw it like in Justin James and some of those longer swingers, it generally happens earlier. And I think if you're gonna make a mistake with forces, making them earlier is a better, is a better thing because that allows time for those forces to get transferred to the club and create speed. If we're not creating vertical forces till after the ball's gone or right around when ball contact happens, that's too late. We're not able to transfer those forces to the, to the club uh, and we lose uh, a lot of speed and efficiency in our swing that way. So moving forces earlier is something that I would say I work on with a good percentage of amateurs. I mean, I would say 80 to 90% of amateurs were trying to move forces earlier in the swing. Um, why is that? I don't know. I think we've kind of created an epidemic of late ground reaction forces in golfers. Could be because we're all trying to stay in our posture and keep our butt on the line and not be an early extender. Uh, who knows why that is? Uh, but I think it, it's, it's a much more common problem that, that forces are too late in the golf swing. And so one way that we can ink or make the forces happen earlier is to reduce the lead foot flare. 
So instead of having our foot really flared, uh, squaring it up is a one way to move forces earlier in the golf swing. If you think you have somebody whose forces are too late or if you have the ability to measure them and you see they're too late, uh, we can also close the stance. So dropping our trail foot back and creating a more closed stance is something that could uh, create forces happening earlier. And also to preload those forces earlier. So I always say, you know, you see Rory on TV who gets to the top and kind of right in transition, he drops down. He's able to drop down and then come back up in the amount of time that his downswing takes, which is a really short period of time, which most people can't do. Uh, Rory's nervous system is a nervous system that 99.99% of us do not have. And so we need to preload earlier. So whether that's kind of doing a little squat in the backswing or even just setting with more squat in, at setup, all those things are gonna allow us to create vertical forces earlier. And obviously the opposite of those things are gonna be the things that allow us to uh, make ground reaction forces happen later. I would say I'd probably use the later uh, ground reaction forces in a handful of times. I think the last time was at the GPC this summer with one of your kids that swings at a incredible speed. He was already at 120 or something like that. And we got him having those forces occur a little later and we got him up to 125 or 130. So generally that's a really rare problem that you see only in very athletic, young, um, super responsive nervous systems. Uh, that's not something that's too often happening. Uh, most often it's, it's moving forces earlier. Finally, uh, we talked about leg dominance and what is our strongest or most dominant leg. Um, and so I've, I've used this test quite a bit to determine uh, what your strongest or most dominant leg is. So you hit shots with your feet together, with your left foot back and with your right foot back, and you look at club head speeds and smash factors or ball speeds to see where you're most efficient. Um, one thing we're finding is that I think this test kind of skews towards center and front dominant because you see the lean in the shaft and the head position gets a lot more forward and center and left. People tend to have their head back and lean the shaft backwards a little more in the right side dominant swing, uh, which makes it a lot more difficult to make contact. Uh, so we're working on some reliability testing for this test and, and, one, and trying to develop some better cues to make it a, a better test. Um, but I still think it's useful to tell us uh, what is your strongest or most dominant leg in the golf swing. And this is something that we wanna gear to our pressure shifts and to our dominant ground reaction force pattern. Uh, so if we're a very left side dominant swinger like Charlie Wee is, we're going to have a very low amount of right side pressure shift. So you can see he only gets 58% of his pressure into his trail side. And then we're going to need a lot of vertical forces in our swing. If we're a very rear leg dominant swinger, this is somebody at the opposite end of the spectrum. This is JB Holmes. He gets 100% of his pressure into his trail side. So he's going to need some horizontal force to push back to the opposite side. And he's going to be a very rear leg dominant or right leg dominant swinger. And if you're in between those two and you have about 80% into your trail side, uh, that's going to be a very centered swinger where we're using both legs about equally. And so I've gone through all of our uh, PJ Tour data and shown that there's a wide range of maximal right pressure in the golf swing. Uh, so you can see Charlie Wee here was the lowest one we've had previously. This is 58%. Uh, I've heard rumors that other people, other PJ Tour players like Cameron Champ is even less than that. He's around 50%. Um, but these would be our more lead leg dominant players, our, our more front post, if you like Mike Adams terms better, players over here. These are our more centered players or center post players or no leg dominance. And these would be our more um, right leg dominant players. Uh, and so we see that matching the ground reaction forces and the pressure shift to their leg dominance is gonna be pretty important. Um, and you know, we're seeing this in PGA Tour players that there's a lot of, a lot of variability. People can stack on their left side and, and be a more lead leg dominant player and still play pretty good golf and still hit it pretty far. If you look at Cameron Champ, one of the longest guys out there, doesn't get much of a pressure shift into the right side. If you had to put Austin Eckroad on here, he'd be more towards the trail leg dominant side. He'd be more over here because he really uses that uh, trail leg a lot more in the swing. And so um, gearing their ground reaction forces and pressure shifts to the individual in front of you is really important. That's something we're gonna show in the little practical session we'll do here in a second. Uh, if you don't have a ground reaction force plate, one thing you can think about kinematically um, is the position of the lead knee in the backswing. So you can see this is, uh, this is uh, Henrik Stenson. And you can see that his lead knee stays very stacked over his foot and his lead knee kind of just comes forward out. That's a very lead leg dominant type of backswing. Uh, Tiger, who's a very centered type of backswing, kicks in, it in a little. And then uh, Bubba, who I flipped around to make a righty here, has a really collapsed in lead side. 
that's a more trail leg dominant backswing. So as we kick that knee in more and more, we get more shift off the ball. That becomes more of a trail leg dominant. So adjusting the position of the lead knee in the backswing is one tool you can use to adjust pressure shifts and change their dominance if you think they're swinging uh, in a way that doesn't match what their dominant style should be. Um, but you have to be very careful with that because if you look at Matt Wolf here, you can see that his lead knee kicks in quite a bit, which you would think maybe he's more of a rear, more of a 80, 90% pressure person into the trail side. But if we look at his, his uh, pressure shift at that particular point, he's 50-50. He's so um, again, I think with ground reaction force plates, you'll never be able to see this with your eye. Uh, they're like an MRI machine for a doctor. Why do we take an MRI? Because we can't see your your ACL with our eye. We need something to look in under the hood or look inside to see what's going on there. And, and that's what ground reaction force and pressure plates allow us to do. They allow us to see things that our video camera or our eye can't see. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. I had some uh, slides here on the ground reaction force moments that a lot of people have asked me about. If you have questions about those, I can come back to these later. But I think I'll leave it at that because I think I've gone over my time, but that's, uh, that's good. And we'll take a little bit of a break here and adjust the cameras, and then we'll do a little practical session where we'll get people on the plate, uh, and you can see kind of what we're looking at and how we use this information in a lesson. Back. We're now here to do our practical session with our player here, Harrison, a really good golfer. Uh, we just had him hit one on the plate, so you can see the information right there. But I'll take a quick second here to answer any questions before we get going working with Harrison, if anybody has any after the lecture. Do we got any questions coming in, Dennis? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. All right, so please type them in if you have any questions. Uh, we will have some time at the end to, uh, to go over those. Uh, so we just had our player here, Harrison, hit one, and you can see the data is up here. Um, a couple of things that I look at first. I mean, the first thing we look at, obviously, is going to be the, the launch monitor data. So his club head speed was 7 iron is actually pretty good, 93.3. He's got a lot of speed. The one thing that kind of show, uh, you know, kind of jumped out at me was his path. So you see a 6.9 degree to the right path or, or in the out path of 6.9 is, is can get away from you, right? And so and I talked to him a bit, and he says, yeah, that's, that's generally my issue, right? Is a too far in the out path can create some blocks and hooks. Uh, so then next we want to look at his pressure shift. And so if you see here, this is his pressure shift. And you can see his maximal right pressure shift or how much he gets into his trail side is 75%. So if we think of our continuum from 100 to 60, that's pretty close to centered. Um, it's pretty close to an 80 degree or a centered pressure shift, uh, maybe slightly on the forward side of center. And so you would see, I would want him based on that pressure shift to have a lot of torque and a lot of vertical. Um, but if we look at his, his swing here, if we talk about his dominant ground reaction force, you could see that he's very good on all three. They get almost to the tour average, all of them, but horizontal gets above the tour average, vertical gets above the tour average, but torque doesn't quite get there. And generally what we're finding is a lot of horizontal force is generally going to drop the club to the inside and create a more in to out path. And based on his pressure shift, um, I would want to increase horizontal force and decrease uh, or increase torque and decrease horizontal force to try to get him to turn the corner a little better. Another assessment that I can see here, remember we want to have a balanced triangle of push off force and braking force. And you see he's got a lot of push up for us, but he's lacking that braking force. And generally it is when we get that torque happening that we post up through that lead side, get a lot more horizontal braking force. Um, and that can allow us to get the club moving a little further to the left. 
That's just a hypothesis. I don't know because I haven't tested them yet. So what I'm going to get them to do is do our little ground reaction or our little leg dominance test really quickly. I'll turn it on to capture mode here. So what I want you to do is hop up there. I want you to put your feet really close together. So I say about one ball width apart. Have you done this before? Yeah. All right, perfect. I want you to hit a full speed shot from there. All right. So that was 90 miles an hour, not much slower than his normal speed. All right, and we'll keep capturing here. Get another ball there. So now you're gonna keep your feet together. You're gonna drop one foot back off the carpet there. Ooh, interesting, he chose his right foot first. So what I want you to do when you're doing your right foot, just make sure your head stays in front of it and the shaft lean stays the same as, as you did before. So you don't wanna get behind it too much. Okay, go full speed from there. That one was a little bit slower, much slower. <laughs> okay, no worries, take that. Okay, and now I want you to do your other foot. Okay, so clearly he's much more comfortable on his lead side and with his feet together than he is on his trail side. And so that tells me he was 91.7 miles an hour with a very solid strike off his left foot. You were 90 miles an hour with a pretty solid strike with your feet together and you're like 50 miles an hour off your right foot. So that tells me that his horizontal force that we saw in his initial um, capture here was not very optimal. Oh, let's go back to his initial one. Oh, that's Dennis, there we go right there. So you see, we got a lot, way too much horizontal force because if you get onto that trail side to push off, your right foot obviously isn't working quite as well as, as it should. So my hypothesis, I wanna increase the torque and increase the vertical. Uh, maintain the pressure shift about the same because that's on the left side of, of center, so that's perfect. And so one thing we'll do to do that is, let me just have a look at your swing here. So if we look at the lead knee position, that's one of the first places I'll go to. You can see that his lead knee stays pretty stacked over his foot. So that's already a really good uh, kind of lead side dominant strategy that you're using. So I'm not gonna affect that too much. But to me, I think the torque is where we could get the most uh, gains if we increase that torque force. Um, and because we found that he's kind of more lead side dominant, I'm gonna give him a lead side torque drill. So let's start that and see what we can do and see if we can affect that path. So I'm gonna get you up there. Let's have the club behind your thighs like this. Perfect, all right. I'm gonna attach this band to it. Just have your hand on the other side of the band. There we go. Once you get in golf posture. So we're gonna use a lead side dominant uh, torque drill here, downswing torque drill. So I'm gonna get you to turn behind it. Do a backswing. Okay, now do downswing. Okay, there was, he's, he's learning. I wanna get you to shove that good. Good. I wanna to try to get that, that hip from going a little, so this seam on your, on your pants right here, don't have it go towards the net first, I want it to go towards the TV. Good, seam on your pants towards the TV, there you go, good. Seam on your pants towards the TV, good. Good, it's like work, huh? Good, I like that movement first, I like the grunt too. All right, awesome. I want you to feel that, let's see what happens. All right, so we got 94.1 miles an hour, so you're up a mile an hour in club head speed. And you see your path now is four. So both of those things tell me I'm on the right track. So if we go here to open recording, let me set these triangles for us so that we have him in, oh shoot, I need the, oh, let me do it the old fashioned way here. There we go. Okay. Okay, so now what you see is we've got the torque now sneaking up into the tour average. So I think we've added a couple Newton meters of torque, which is what our goal was. Um, and if we look at the, um, the launch monitor data, we're now 94.1, so we're almost up a whole mile an hour from your first swing. And you see now my path isn't 6.9 anymore, it's four. 
So we've moved it from 6.9 into out to four into out, which means you're turning the corner a little better and avoiding that big path that ends up being our big miss. Um, more speed, which is good, but we still didn't get a good horizontal braking force. That's something I might wanna work on with you. And we've also introduced a second spike vertical, which as we talked about, or you, you weren't here when we talked about it, but um, that's something that I'm not very big fan of because it could create injury. Obviously you're young and athletic and healthy, so might not be a huge deal, but down the road, it's something I wouldn't want you to keep happening. Let's see if we can get a little more. We'll do one more um, quick torque drill, but you see that position too. If we look at your position there, you can see how that left hip now is moving backwards. We can see your left butt cheek, so it's not your kind of in to out kind of humpy swing there that, that uh, is not good. All right, let's give you a few more drills here and let's see if we can get a couple more miles an hour out of you and get you get that path moving a little further to the left. Go ahead, push, good. So that seam back to the TV, good. Seam back to the TV, good. Good, he's getting a lot stronger here. I can't pull him over. The first one I could pull him over pretty easily. He's established that neural connection. I really like it. All right, hit one more. Let's see what happens. Ninety five point nine now. Well, we got our path a little more into out, but it's still less than it was before. So let's have a look at that one. So we've definitely added some speed. You see you're now 95.9 or 96 miles an hour. That's almost three miles an hour up from where you were before. We lost a little bit of, of the path, so we're up about a degree in path to the right. Um, but still 5.4 is a lot more manageable than 6.9. Uh, let's have a look at your, at your ground reaction force. Let's see what we did. All right, so I think we're making good changes here based on my hypothesis. So you can see now your purple graph that used to be in the tour average is now below the tour average, so we brought that one down. Your yellow graph that used to be below the tour average is in the tour average, so we've added more of this and taken some of this away. The vertical force is up, that second spike is down, all those are good things, and I think that's where your extra club head speeds come from. Um, we've also moved your path a little more to the left, which makes sense as we add more torque. So all good things there. Um, if I had some more time with him, I would start to work on that horizontal braking force. So we want a nice negative spike here. Um, and that would be uh, a different set of drills. You can see that you do turn it on. It just happens a little a bit late. And so that's something we would want to be working on. The outside part of this left hip, if we're going to go to the gym, is something I'd be working on because that's the thing that stops us and turns us around. So some glute medius work on the left side would be something if I was talking to your physical trainer. But to me, working on adding torque um, really did its job here. And based on the hypothesis that we made would be some good things for you. Awesome, nice job. Anybody, did we lose Dennis for our questions? Anybody have any questions based on uh, what we did there? So again, that's just a quick, uh, assessment. So I assessed him. I looked at his initial, um, his initial swing and saw that there were some things that didn't quite uh, match up. Then we did a test and we saw that those matchups were probably going towards the fact that he's more lead to center dominant. We need more torque and less horizontal. We gave him a drill and it did what we thought it would do to the, um, to the ground reaction forces. It did what we thought it would do to the uh, launch monitor data. And so I think all good things. And now we want to practice appropriately, right? We wanna give them some drills to do in the gym, some stuff to do at home and some, some practice strategies to make that thing stick so that you know, that swing shows up on the first tee when we're under pressure or uh, not the old one where we're kind of getting that in to out pattern. And question. Perfect. Joe Spivak, uh, in addition to the band work, what other drills or feels would you give this player to work on? I mean, one of the ones that I gave him was an external cue to create rotation. So you saw when I had the band behind him like this, so I should talk to you, not to you. Um, when he first started, I, I saw this motion happen first before he started that. So one of the good external cues kinematically for rotation is to take like the seam on his pants and turn it back to the TV, right? So instead of towards the, t towards the net, seam on his pants towards the TV back there. And, and that's what I've learned from my buddy, Will Wu, who's a motor learning expert is external cues, movement cues generally work a lot better than internal cues. 
So the seam on your pants, the TV, the seam on your pants, external, the TV's external, that's a good external cue versus, you know, turn your hip more or whatever it is, because the hip's part of you. So uh, I gave him that external cue, movement cue, along with the band cue, um, and that seemed to work pretty well. It's not always gonna work well. Sometimes you gotta get creative. Sometimes this drill doesn't work, uh, and you'll have to try to find different ways to make it happen. Maybe it's gym work, you know, having some more rotational drills in the gym. I've seen for him maybe a jump twist, like a jump 360. So if he can jump and spin, that gets the two forces that I'm working on, right? Torque and vertical, which are the two that he needs. So some jump twists could help. There's lots of different tools that you have to have in your toolbox. This one with the band, though, I think it is one of the most effective that I've seen so far. Seems to work quite a bit. Not for everyone, though. So you got to have more tools in your toolbox as well. But really good question there. Uh, just a follow up to that from Cody, um, you know, as Joe said, so how does he, how would he do that on his own? Um, I mean, this is where a band like this, I mean, you could do this on your own if you have some solid surface to tie it around. So you could tie it to a door handle or, you know, anything that you have that's not going to move. So if you just tie it to something and then hop in here, put your club around it, you could do it on your own pretty easily. Uh, this band's a little tough because it's pretty firm, but if you have like a great cook band or one of those ones that are a little lighter, you could tie it around anything, a golf bag, anything that's heavy enough to not fall over. So, I mean, we could do it this way. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'll hop over here. So put that through your club. Now you're going to face the other way. Yeah, there you go. Put that through your club. Put the club behind you. And yeah, yeah, there you go. So there we go. So if this was a solid surface, he could do it himself like this. I got to hold it down here because this isn't quite so solid as a surface. Good. Awesome. So yeah, rubber bands are great because you can, I mean, I know they've designed some of those bands to tie into door so you can close the door on it and it stays solid. So that's all the ways that he could work on it on his own. All right, we have a few more uh, flowing in. And if you want to- Perfect, let's do it. Yeah, let's keep going, man. Uh, they're sort of separate from this specific scenario. With a young female golfer, 10 to 11 years old, how does one get her not to fly and spin her trail heel out while rotating her hips way ahead? Her front foot also leaves the ground slightly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's hard for me to know without having her here to test, but uh, if the trail side is flying out of there, you wanna give them more trail side push cues. Um, so like if I was to give him, so hop up there a second. If his trail side was spinning out and I felt like he wasn't using his trail side as well as possible, put the club uh, in front of your thighs. Yeah, like that. Okay, this isn't a good drill for him, but we'll just put it and put your hand right there. Okay, turn back, now turn through. You can see it's impossible for him to get off that foot because he has to use it to push. This, he's not very good at this one because we already figured out that his right leg isn't so strong. So there's, I could pull him over super easily here, but we already learned that about him. So this isn't a drill for him, but that might be a good drill for somebody who you find their foot's just spinning out and they're not using it that much. Um, you could also do a horizontal force drill. So I just slip that over your head. And so take it to the top. Okay, we know that he doesn't want to create horizontal force, but he's going to learn how to push that foot in the ground. There you go, and go forward. This is the opposite of what he would want, so I don't want to give this to you. This is not good for you. Um, but that is a good example of, so anyone who's like losing their foot or it's flying all over the place to keep it grounded, just pull them either a torque or in a horizontal fashion away from the target so they have to really plant that foot and use it. But again, that's not for everyone. I'm not sure if she's a trail leg dominant person. If she's a lead leg dominant person, I actually don't mind that foot kind of flying out because it would stay... And this is something that we need to talk about whether, you know, in a junior, do you want to guide them towards an imbalance or do you want to try to fix the imbalance for a long-term gain? Um, I don't know the answer to that question yet. And that's something we can talk about later. Okay. Uh, a couple of general questions, um, just talking about early extension. Do you have any comments on early extension? Yeah, I mean, to me, he kind of described to me that he thinks he might be an early extender. Um, and what we did was give him that torque drill. So if he learns to push that left hip back and not up, you know, so if the lead hip comes forward and the left hip comes back. That, so I think generally adding torque to somebody's swing is a good cure for early extension. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, as I told you before with the little knobs, I've seen people turn up horizontal force and get worse swings. I've seen people turn up vertical force and get worse swings. This game is inherently a rotational game. So I've yet to see somebody turn up torque and have a worse swing. So generally more torque I think is a good thing. And so giving them some lead side torque drills I think would be a really good way to prevent early extension and, um, and get, uh, get that hip moving backwards. So like if there was a line on me, if I can get in that position through impact, you know, it would stay on there a lot better. Awesome. Uh, what would be an example of a drill for breaking force? 
Uh, breaking force would be the opposite of what I just showed him. So he actually does need this drill, so this is a good one for him. Let me wrap this around. It's better to have a longer club to do this, or a longer band, so you don't get smashed by the club. Okay, so I want you to take it back, and now transition slowly. Oh, he didn't have break there. Okay, go again. Transition slowly. Right here, I want to pull him. There you go. So look how that leg is posting up, and he's learning to push that foot towards me and stop himself. Good. So this is one that I actually wouldn't mind doing with him because he was lacking braking force. So you saw the first one, I pulled him over, right? I pulled him towards me, and he's learned now how to stick that foot in the ground and stop himself, post up through that lead side and brake. So that to me is one of the best braking force drills. Again, you gotta keep your timings in mind when you're working on forces. So the braking force is gonna happen in the late downswing, so that's when you wanna keep it light, 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 and then pull right here, and that's when they gotta learn how to post up through that lead side. So understanding your timings is really important when you're applying uh, reactive neuromuscular training. Uh, so this is specific to Harrison again. Even though he is a front side dominant, would you ever want to improve his right leg ability? That's a really good question. I mean, um, if I want him to play well, like right now, no. Right now, let's just keep him on the lead side. Let's get the torque and the vertical happening. If your goal is to play well, you know, five years from now, and you want to make a college team or whatever, maybe. Maybe we can send him to the gym and really get him more balanced. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I just know that there are a lot of PGA Tour players who look like Harrison, right? Who have horizontal or have vertical and torque and not a lot of horizontal and still make a lot of money and hit the ball really well. I don't know the long-term answer to that. This, this technology has not been around long enough for us to really understand. Do we want to work out imbalances? Like, is it possible even to work out that imbalance? I don't know. I mean, he's a young enough guy. Maybe those motor patterns aren't set down enough that we could change them. Is he going to play some bad golf for a little while if we try to change them? Probably. Is he gonna be able to survive that and push through it mentally? There's so many factors that you gotta weigh um, to decide whether you're gonna do that. But uh, most of what we've done so far with these plates are the, the hour golf lesson, right? So if you wanna hit him, hit it, wanna have him hitting it better in an hour, then I wanna go with what his body currently does. But if we have access to a gym and we have, you know, we have lots of time and we don't care about how we play for the next little while, then maybe we would try to go down that road. And, I just don't have enough long-term data to know the answer to that question. Great. For the leg dominance test, is there historically a number of shots that you would like to see hit, or is it more reading numbers and seeing drastic difference regardless of the number of shots? Yeah, I mean, if I have a lot of time with a player, I prefer more shots in a randomized order. So I'll just have, I mean, you, what you could do is make little sh sheets of paper with right, left, and center, and just crumple them up and put them in a, in a hat and have them pick them out. So he's doing them at random orders. I mean, I would say five shots of each would be a good way to calculate averages and, and throw out any like, you know, random shots that might have happened. Um, but that depends on the time you have. So obviously today, you know, we're just moving really quickly. And, and it was pretty clear to me when he was 91 miles an hour on his left and 90 on his center and then 50 miles an hour on his right. I mean, it's pretty clear to me there he's center to left, so I'm ready to go. I, I was pretty confident making a decision then. Um, but I think it is always better to collect more data if you have the time. So I would say three swings doesn't take that long. So if you do three swings of each condition, but what you want to do is do a little scientific study and randomize them. You don't want to do all three of one, then the next, and then the other. Just try to, so my best randomization technique would be to have a hat with little pieces of paper inside. So you have nine pieces of paper, three of them say center, three of them say right, three of them say left. And before each one, he just picks one out. Left, okay, I'm gonna do this one. Picks one out, left again. Oh, now it's center, now it's right. So randomizing them, and then I know in a lot of uh, software programs, they, uh, launch monitor software, you can like color them appropriately. So like the red color are the centered trials, the blue are the right, and the green are the left or whatever. And a lot of them, like the foresight, will calculate an average and a standard deviation for you. And then you look at him and say, which one do you like better? Like. And if one has a lot more speed, a lot more solid impact, a lot more ball speed, you're like, that's probably the one. So, um, but it is, it's an art more than a science when you make that decision at the end, because you got to ask him questions too, because he's the one who has to do it. And um, I have had people where I, they test out to be fully left leg, but they don't want to be left leg because of the kind of negative connotations that come with kind of a stack and tilty feel. And so if they don't want to do it, then we got to make another decision and try to go another way. So um, again, it's working out the messiness that is involved here, but everything that he told me and everything kind of went along with what, uh, so this was an easy one. You're, you're not super messy, which is good. <laughs> Luckily, I got lucky here that I got a, a non-messy one for my live lesson here. Uh, 
Uh, one more about the band. So the, the green band color, the best one, that this person only has the black. Is that the right you know, amount of tension? Again, I mean, the band doesn't, it, it's really how hard you pull it on the other end. And so that's, that's more of an art than a science when I'm pulling it, because I want to give him back what he can give me. And I actually don't mind on the first one to kind of pull him over a little bit, because then it cues him, oh, I did that wrong. I got to figure out how to stop it. But then I only want to give him back kind of what he gives me. And as he gets stronger, I pull more and more. So it doesn't really matter what the tension of the band is. It's really how far away you are that matters, right? So if it's a really light band, you just get a little further away to get more tension on it. So whatever you have around, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's just the one that I travel with right now. So that's the one we use. So yeah, the tension of the band doesn't matter. It's, it's more you as a coach got to start feeling like, obviously you don't want to just destroy him every, every time. Right. Cause then he gets defeated. You want to give him, I think the first one, if you give him a little extra and he kind of falls that cues him and then you just give him what he can give back to you. And on some, with him on subsequent reps, I was pulling really hard. So he figured it out and he could stop me. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's, let's hit one now. Cause I, I felt like I created that neural connection and, and that's where the art of coaching comes in. It's, there's no real science behind it. It's more you kind of giving them back what they give you. Perfect. Good question. Those are all our questions. Oh, we get just another one popped in. Perfect. Generally, uh, this is generally open stance to improve hip rotation on downswing question mark. Um, again, that's something you have to weigh the, the pluses and minuses. Um, so his in to out path, one possible um, answer to that would be to open the stance, right? To get the path moving a little further left, but then you have to weigh the consequences of that and other things. So if you look here, his vertical force, his peak vertical is actually pretty early. So that's good. Um, his peak vertical force is pretty early. So that means he has some room to go there because opening the stance will move it uh, later in time. Because his is early, that might be a good strategy. So opening your stance is something you can play with with him for sure. If I saw that vertical force being too late, I definitely wouldn't want him to try to open his stance because it's already too late. We need to find another way. So whether it's foot flare to help him turn a little more through it, all those types of things. And this is where obviously you'd have you'd want to have an assessment to see what his mobilities are and, and if there's restrictions there, uh, how to work around them. But uh, yeah, that's a really good idea based on everything I know about him and everything I've learned about him through his ground reaction forces opening the stance is, is a logical thing to test for sure. That's all the questions for now. Awesome. Good. Thing. Thank you, man. That was awesome. Thank you so much for your help. I think we got one more guy here. How you doing, man? Scott. Hi. Tyler. Nice to see you. All right. So what are you going to do? Are you warmed up? Have you been hitting some? Oh, awesome. So hit one for us. Let's see what you got. All right. That one hit a little heavy. Yeah. Want another one? Yeah. Let's just uh, get a normal one. Once you feel like that's kind of my normal shot, we'll we'll go for it. Hang on one second. Just reset this. All right, go for it. Still don't like that one? Yeah. One more? <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. All right, let's set that. That's good? All right. I think it uh, got some funny numbers there. It's telling me your club speed is 122 miles per hour. I don't think that's true. <laughs> Something's going on with the clod there. All right. <laughs> Something went wacky there, but anyways. All right. So we don't, let's see what the last ones were if they got the same. Yeah, it's getting crazy club speeds. I don't know what you've done to it, but I've never seen the quad do that before. All right. That's not, that, Bryson doesn't even swing a seven iron at speed. All right. 
All right, so clearly he is a predominantly vertical player. So you can see that none of these two reach the tour average, but the vertical is way above the tour average. So he's a predominantly vertical player. Let's see if that matches his pressure shift. So it doesn't really. You can see that he gets a ton of pressure into his trail side. So he's like 89% into his trail side and predominantly vertical. So your pressure shift looks like a right dominant player, but your ground reaction force looks like a left dominant player. So there's a big mismatch there, which is probably why you hit a first couple fat. Um, and so there's, uh, there's some, what we always say is you got tons of potential. We can, we can do some stuff with this. All right, so let's, uh, should I like restart the quad or what do you think to, you wanna restart it? Cause it's getting some wacky numbers there. I've never seen it do that before. I was wondering why your smash factor was so low. It's because your club bed speeds are so high. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're gonna do our little leg dominance test here. There we go, we're reconnected to the quad. Let's get you some more golf balls. All right, so what I'm gonna get you to do is you're gonna put your feet together, like one ball width apart. Would you, yeah, there you go, good. Golf ball, not baseball, a little narrower. There you go, perfect. Okay, I want you to hit it full speed from there. Let's see. All right. Jeez, it's still getting 115 club speed, oh well. Let's assume that it goes up when you swing it faster and goes down when you swing it slower. All right, well, let's say, I don't, that's not correct, but we'll, we'll go with it. All right, 115. So now what I want you to do is put your feet together and drop one foot back onto the carpet behind you. Good. Now I want you to tap that toe so there's no pressure on it, the right foot. Just tap it a little bit, there you go. Now go full speed from there. Okay, that one was hit a little fat. Club speed was much more normal there. Well, maybe not, I said 94. I doubt you would swung that one 94, but all right. Okay, but obviously not as good. And now go on your right foot. A hundred, okay. So your centered one was the best. You went down on your right foot and down on your left foot, so we gotta keep you kinda centered. So obviously if we look at his first testing session, if our uh, quad was working okay. If you're 122 mile an hour club speed. Um, we gotta decrease a little bit of the pressure into your trail side to make you more centered, because I want you around 80. And that could be done by limiting the, the the knee kick in, but I actually don't mind that. Mm -hmm. If we limit the knee kick in, we might give you more vertical, which we don't need, you already have that. So what we're gonna do here is try to give you more torque, just like the last guy. But I want this torque graph to come up. Does it, did it give us path and face? Yeah, so your path was 10 to the right there. Is that, do you generally have a right word path? That's a little extreme, but it can get out there. Okay, so same thing with him. Um, that's a little too much rightward path for a centered player. We wanna get you turning the corner a little better. And so my hypothesis for you is to try to add torque. Um, I, I'm not sure if this launch monitor is giving me true answers, but we'll go with what it's saying <laughs> for right now and see what happens. Um, and so which one was better? Were you faster off your right foot or your left foot? I forget. I think it was your left foot that was faster, right? Okay, so let's start with a left foot torque cue and see what happens and see if he can get some more torque and see if that helps his, his uh, launch monitor conditions. All right, so I'm gonna have you put the club behind you again. We have two people who need more torque here. Just put your hand on the other side of that. There we go. All right, so now I want you to get in golf posture and just move the club down a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now turn back, do a backswing. Now turn through. Okay, good. Turn back, turn through. Good, okay. 
Turn back, turn through. Okay, good. So again, we want to apply the resistance right when he's around what left arm parallel would be in his transition, go ahead, or in the downswing, and then drop it off a little bit, let him get to the finish. You want to apply the resistance where the torque is being applied in time. There we go, okay. And again, and back. Good, okay. Let's try that, see what happens to our crazy launch monitor numbers. Just hit normal, try to feel that same thing we just felt with our lower body. Okay, so that was 112 club head speed. I'm not sure what it was before, but our path went down to 8.7. So it was 10 and it's 8.7. So that tells me that we're moving in the right direction. Let's see if our torque went up. Put this one on impact here, close enough. All right, so we had 0.7 or 0.95 force factor. And if we go back to one of your previous ones, we had 0.6 and 0.9. So we did increase torque. So that thing did its job. It moved the path further left. I don't know about those speeds. We're not gonna put any stake in those because they're a little crazy. Uh, but we got the path down about two degrees. Um, and we also got the torque up. So it seems to me like we're doing the right thing. Um, and I think I like cueing that front side for you because you tend to shift off of it too much and get to the outside half of that foot, which, which equals those fat shots. And so if I cue your left side, you're more likely to stay on your left a little more and not shift off of it quite as much, which I think is a good thing for you. All right, so let's give you a couple more here, a couple more torque drills, see if we can ramp it up a little more. I'm not sure what happened to our launch monitor there, but. <laughs> We'll keep going. Okay, turn back, turn through. Good. So now I can pull pretty significantly and not knock him over. That means he's created that neural connection and he's got some good muscle activity in creating that torque. Good. Awesome, all right, nice job. Hit one more for me. Well, that gave us some more normal club speed that time, and we're down to 7.6. So we've taken your path down three degrees. Um, it gave me a normal club head speed that time. Unfortunately, your club head speed went down 30 miles per hour on that one, but <laughs> what are we gonna do about that? <laughs> I know. All right, and let's just open this and see what our torque was. Oh, wow, so we're up a lot, 1.0 and 0.74. So that torque is up significantly. That's probably a 15% torque increase, which is where your, your better path numbers are coming from. So it sounds like we're on the right, on the right path. And see so you and your buddy uh, Harrison gotta go work on your torque. So now you got a workout buddy to work with because you guys are kind of working on the same thing. So unfortunately we picked two random people and had the same, uh, the same thing, but uh, we didn't plan it at all. So this was good. This was kind of what would happen in a real lesson. So hopefully that makes sense. Good work, man. Thank you. All right. Got some questions, Dennis? Uh, teaching many younger students, many of them hook the ball for distance. Would you say this is a reason for the path being significantly into out and the low torque issues that you have or see? Definitely. I think that definitely could be the case. Um, and I mean, that's, that's something that, uh, you know, as they grow and get bigger and stronger, um, then they won't have to hook it anymore for distance. So um, it, it, I think it's good to control a very rightward path because that can get out of control. That happened to me personally. I had a very rightward path, a little baby draw when I had no club head speed. And then when my speed went up, it turned into a snap hook, which is um, a pretty uh, frustrating way to play the game because um, that ball doesn't stop. Uh, so that, that could be the case, but th these are the kind of things that we want to learn through the doing the research here with the, with the GPC is to understand uh, as uh, kids grow, what happens? Because we don't have any of that longitudinal data that I'm aware of. Um, and so um, I, I think just a 10 degree right path is just not functional. Um, I mean, I don't think you want to start slinging it like that because um, as you start getting more speed and getting stronger, uh, that could definitely get out of control. But uh, Again, you have to ask yourself, when does this kid have to play well? Um, 
it does, does he have a, I mean, it's January here, so I'm assuming he doesn't have a tournament tomorrow, so it's probably good to try to rein that path in. Um, and, and I would say 10 degrees is not playable. That's, that's going to result in some pretty serious blocks and hooks. So, um, but, but, I mean, you are right. I think a lot, of, a lot of slower swingers do use a draw to try to create more distance because uh, it hits and rolls, but um, it rolls further into the jungle too, as I've learned in my own experience. <laughs> Uh, but a good question, yeah, and, and I don't think we know the answer to that until we start getting more data. Uh, that's all the questions. That's all the have. questions. Do we want to have a quick little sure. chat here? We'll bring Roger in and set up some. Uh... Set up some chairs. Let me move this out of the way here real quick. We good here, Bell? <laughs> it's not perfect. It's never perfect for Bell. <laughs> but we're going to uh, we're going to make do. We got our sound good, Bell. Do you have any questions, Mike? Yeah. yeah uh, Question, uh, Scott. Are there ever instances where you would look at stance width to changing forces? 100%. Uh, so generally, uh, widening your stance will allow you to go side to side more, and narrowing your stance will allow you to create more torque. Um, and so, um, or will allow, it's easier for you to rotate from a narrower stance. So um, that is definitely something you could work with. Um, I didn't mess with that on these two guys. Uh, I know Dr. David Wright does some really good stuff around stance width that you, that you might want to study. Um, but generally, I mean, if I was going to change stance width in either of those two guys, I would have narrowed their stance a hair because that generally makes it uh, easier to rotate and create more torque. And so I will, uh, I, if I were to make a stance with change on those two guys because I decided one, they, they needed more torque, it would have been to narrow it a hair. Um, if I decide they need more horizontal, then widening it is pretty good. Um, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes even with torque, you might want to widen it. Um, I find a good cue for people who get to the outside half of their trail foot they get way out here, sometimes widening it a little bit, even if they don't want more horizontal is good because it keeps them, kind of gives them a kickstand, keeps them on the inside half of their trail foot. So uh, that's why it's really good to have a ground reaction force plate because the swing catalyst dials in your stance width on every swing. And so you can see what it is and you can mess with it and do, and I think that's the best way to teach is do a little scientific study. My hypothesis is if I narrow his stance, that might be better. So let's try it, narrow it, hit a few, and if torque, <laughs> If torque goes down and we start seeing the path go more to the right, you're like, okay, well, that's probably not a good thing for you. Let's, let's cancel that. Um, but if it starts going in the correct direction, my drills went in the correct direction, then you could decide other ways. So a stance with change for both of those guys that would make sense to me would be to try to narrow it. Um, so that does make a lot of sense. Just a follow-up question on that, Scott, with stance with, you know, obviously you've seen a lot of tour players. You know, how much do you see their stance with change from, say, a six iron to a driver and you know, how much are they factoring in angle of attack and how much that, that affects that, and obviously how they're, they're using the ground. Yeah, obviously the, the, um, the width does increase as we get to, um, to longer clubs. Um, but generally the dominant ground reaction force pattern stays the same. Okay. Um, and and it's, it's generally, you know, as we widen the stance and we get a bigger club in our hand, the, all the forces kind of ramp up. But generally, I haven't seen it where widening a stance changes me to now a dominant horizontal player where before I was a dominant vertical player. It generally doesn't, isn't the case. Generally, those patterns are very consistent across clubs. Um, it just, the magnitudes ramp up as we get longer clubs. And, and obviously, the stance width does widen. Um, but in most people, that doesn't create a change in the dominant ground reaction force. So, um, and, and I think that's something you got to play with with each player um, and figure out what works best for them. I mean, I know if you watch Cameron Chan with his driver, he looks like me hitting a wedge. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, I mean, works for him clearly, and he hits it really far. Whereas right. if you took my stance and put it that, I'd probably hit my driver like 90 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> and so it's something you got to play with with each person because I'm kind of a glider. I do need a little bit wider stance. Um, and so that's something, again, everybody's messy and and I know Dr. David Wright has some like, you know, ideas about how to dial in somebody's stance width, but even in his system, you have certain widths that will work for you, like a wider one, a medium one. And so, um, right. and I just find it, it's really tough under the gun to like, I mean, dial it into the inch or to the like, you know, you just gotta say, hey, I generally tell people, hey, if you're gonna make a mistake, if you're not too sure, just narrow it a hair, cause that works better for you. Yeah. So generally wider is bad for you cause you get too much on your trail side and you start chunking it too much. So if you're gonna make a mistake on the golf course under the gun, 
Let's just narrow it a little more than you normally would. I like that. Well, well yeah. that, that also can play a, a big role in ball position too, right? And ball position probably has a, a role in this as well. It right? totally does, yeah. And, and uh, uh, I know Mike Adams has a little chart to, de to determine what your ball position is. But again, I like to just give players like under the gun, I know if my ball sneaks too far back, that's when I start hooking it because yeah. the path gets way into out. So if I'm going to make a mistake, it's going to be way up there. Yeah. And so that's better for me because I know that get, that gets rid of my double bogey miss, which is the big snapper. Because um, once I get the ball up there, that path starts coming around to the left, and so that. Uh, so I think giving players that type of uh, that type of knowledge, hey, under the gun when you're under pressure, just make sure you don't like. If you're gonna make a mistake, just go too narrow, because that's gonna make sure that your your big miss doesn't show up. Or if you're gonna make a mistake, put it too far forward. Yeah. Um, it, you know, actually, one of the things that you talked about earlier was I think it was Harrison, and you mentioned it uh, briefly was assessment. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think that's one of the things I, I'd like for the audience to really know too is it's really good to assess your players before you start going Messing ahead and giving stuff. the yeah, yeah exactly I think that's one of the things that we see a lot especially younger players um, is we assume they have certain range of ability yep. stability and not really kind of uh, you know looking them as hey maybe they actually have some issues yep. movement issues or stability issues or strength issues that's a big part of it totally uh, and I think, so uh, yeah, understanding when, that yeah when you have and and i know every um you know high level coach the pga tour has both people right there's the physical trainer that assesses that there's you know they have all of those things in place which you guys have here which is awesome um but and, and i was talking to uh, boyd summerhays in uh, in phoenix the other day and, and he has his players do like a single leg Kaiser uh, leg extension mm -hmm. to see how much power they can create off each leg. And I think that would have a high correlation to my leg dominance test. So maybe that's a better test than hitting off this leg and that leg. And I mean, I don't know. So I'm, I'm always searching for better ways to assess because I think that's the key. Once yeah. you understand that human that's standing in front of you better, you can tailor the golf swing to them much better rather yeah. than trying to force them to do something that you saw in Golf Digest or yeah. whatever. <laughs> right, right. Except you saw the recent Golf Digest with Tyler in there. Yeah, you know, right. Tyler, pretty... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do that for yeah. sure, whatever he tells but, me. <laughs> but but I, I think one of the things we see a lot of players is the compensatory movements that, that we cause by creating some of these drills that we – if we don't know those issues yeah. and then we start giving them drills all of a sudden you're getting these compensatory movements that could actually make everything worse so 100 how do you address that with some of your players well i mean that's where you have to have a good team around you right of people to assess and so that's where you know the, with the pga player or tour coaches that i work with you know i'm their biomechanics assessment so mm -hmm. like i i do my assessments on them and i tell the coach hey these are the type of things i want you to work on try not to do these and then they have the physical trainer that says hey these are some of the restrictions and and so as long as you have a good team around you of people giving advice and everybody's on the same page and we're all working towards the same goal um, of understanding that human um, is important. I mean, I, I've uh, worked a lot with Tony Ruggiero who works with Lucas Glover and mm -hmm. Lucas, if he hits a one yard butter cut that starts one yard left of the flag and cuts to like a foot, he hates it. Yeah. He wants to see the ball drop. So that's some mental messiness that biomechanically, I might want him to create more torque and have the path moving a little further left, but he just doesn't like that window. He doesn't want to see it moving in that direction. So we got to make it work the way. And if I, if I just yeah. did my assessment and didn't talk to him and didn't talk to Tony and didn't talk to the physical assessment people, we may go down the wrong, or I may try to steer them down the wrong path. So it's important to everybody be on the same page. And every, and really it's, it's that guy, the person yeah. that's hitting the ball that needs to make the ultimate decision, right? right. Like that it could make the most biomechanical sense and physical sense to do it one way, but if they're not buying in, right. which kind of happened with Matt Kuchar when we worked with him, um, <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not doing it that way. So like, okay, well, let's let's yeah. make sure it matches up the way you want to do it, um, yeah. which is fine. I mean, it, it's it, again, they're the one that has to pull the trigger, and they're the one who has to go find it afterwards. So yeah. um, you got to make sure that that you're asking them questions and that they understand everything along the way. So yeah. especially with really good players. I mean, maybe you know, Mrs. Haverkamp, you might be able to tell her, hey, do it this way. Yeah. Um, but with good players, uh, they know where the, the windows they want to see the ball come in and right. the way they like to see it curve and. And you got to have the skills to match it up to make it do that for them. Right. And, but that's also kind of a, a scary thing, too, for Mrs. Haverkamp, right? Is it is it that corrective time window? Because there is a window there. And I think, you know, we tend to kind of look at the hour lesson that's out there on the lesson tee. You did some great drills. Maybe we made a neural connection. That's great. Let's call it Magic Mountain, if you will, on the sure. lesson tee. Yep. But that takes more time because there's, again, the, the imprinting of that takes a lot more time to change patterns. A hundred percent. And that's where I, I really like uh, the training program that my friend John Dunnigan and Will Wu are doing. They call it the Skilled Coaching Alliance, mm -hmm. which is the motor learning strategies after that. Because um, my buddy Will will say, whatever drills I've just discovered, those are their ingredients, right? Both right. of those guys needed more torque. That's their ingredients. 
but now you got to send them and teach them how to cook. Right. Uh, so they know what their ingredient is, but they got to understand how to cook so they can put it together in their own brain, you know, on the, yeah. on the third hole tomorrow when they're on balls above their feet and they're the right to left wind and, you know, all those things that, uh, that we have to deal with and yeah. ball sitting down on the rough a little bit. And so, um, that, that's the motor learning side of things, which is really important. So creating appropriate practice strategies and, and, and to me, a really good practice strategy for, for anyone is to use what John Dunham calls the, uh, the Goldilocks effect mm -hmm. or the Goldilocks principle. So I would have them try to maximize their torque. Okay, now give me a really low torque. Try to go side to side and so like do it wrong, basically. Right, yeah. Um, so that they understand what that feels like and what the ball does when they do it wrong. Because then if they're on the course and the ball starts doing that, they got a strategy to deal with it. Right. Um, so I think that just gives you power. I mean, to me, the way, the reason people quit this game and the reason they play really terrible is if they, the ball's doing something, they have no idea why. And yeah. they have no strategy to deal with it. Yeah. Well, that's the right approach to learning, right? It's not just about getting it right. It's about yeah. understanding, getting better awareness. So, yeah. Like you yeah. said, so you can self-correct. I mean, that, that's a totally different approach. Right? Totally. And what it feels like when you do it wrong. So actually doing it wrong in practice is very valuable. Um, yeah. To do it wrong on cue yeah. and understand what the ball does when you do it wrong is, is good. So I hit a little fat and then hit little duck hooks when I get too far into my trail side. Okay, I get that. I can... I can deal with that because if you hit one like that and you don't know why, then you're in trouble. But if you hit one yeah. like that, you're like, oh, I got that. Yeah. And the next one's probably going to be better. Yeah. As I say, the, the information is only valuable if you know what to do with it, right? Sure. So. 100%. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the true with any uh, yeah. technology. I mean, when launch monitors first came out, you know, and they spit all those numbers out of us, yeah. we're like, whoa. Like, for me, yeah. it was a, a $30,000 clubhead speed measure. Right. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, those little Nebo things would have done the same thing. But now that we understand path and place and low point and all those things, it, yeah it becomes a useful tool. And I think the ground reaction force plates are getting to that point now where we really start to understand those numbers and can use them to help everyone. Now, now te technology has obviously been a great tool in our industry, in our game, if you will. And obviously it's moving into other sports uh, much more than it ever has. Yeah. Um, do you see there's going to come a time where technology becomes you know, maybe too much if it were used the wrong way? Or maybe, you know, I know for here, it's all about measurement. It's not necessarily just you know doing drills on it it's yep. really just kind of identifying where we are at a point yep. uh, of development right so totally yeah and that's where uh my buddy will the motor learning expert says the people who use technology really well use it very sparingly yeah so you assess you get an idea and then you're off because like you're not going to meet like and to me kids you see a lot of times on the ring they hit it and before they even see the ball land they land they're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. like you want to have a feel yeah. and, and that's where like putting a towel over the launch monitor or shutting off the tv screen and let them hit it and let them stew for a while. Like my, my buddy Will calls it, shut your pie hole. Like let them <laughs> feel what they felt and watch the ball do what it did. And actually like in here where they can't even watch the ball do what they right. did, they can just feel impact and try to put it together in their head to learn stuff. And so yeah. the, the way you give and take away feedback, especially augmented feedback, like, like ground reaction force plates and launch monitors is super important. You can't become dependent on it because yeah. it's not sitting there um, when yeah. we're out playing the game for real. So yeah. Um, yeah, so I think the people who use it really well use it very sparingly, like yeah. assess, get the idea, okay, now go, go in work a real on. life situation and practice it. And then once you practice for a while, come back and assess, are we moving in the right direction? Are we moving in the wrong direction? Okay, cool, let's go back. and. Yeah. And so, yeah, using it sparingly, which is, I mean, obviously a bad uh, um, sales pitch <laughs> for the yeah. technology, but, but it's, it's still a, a super valuable tool to make sure you're Absolutely. going in the right direction. Yeah. But, and it's still used sparingly. Um, it, it's still super valuable to have. So, um, and that's where, like, if, if I, for some reason, this is the only space I had and my students were practicing on here, I shut the computer off or yeah. shut the screen off at least so they can't see anything. Even if it's yeah. collecting in the background, they're still using their own feels and their own yeah. uh, inputs that they get and their own proprioceptive feedback that they're getting. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, it just, use it to validate and to, or to dispel or to see if you're going in the wrong direction or the right direction um, yeah. or see if you need to change something. But yeah, yeah, using it sparingly, I think is, is key. You can't have people become too dependent on it. Yeah. Yeah, I tell people that all the time coming in that, you know, we have this expensive technology, but we don't spend a lot of time on it. In fact, we spend most of the hours learning with, you know, the $15 band or, yep. you know, the cheap training aid. That's yep. where you actually learn. Then you come back and remeasure and see if there's been a change. Totally. That's different than standing on a swing cat and trying to make the numbers, you know, look like the way you want. Sure. Or track trackman or... Or yeah, track right. man or anything. Yeah. And, and Any I, of those, yeah. That's why I've had, I've worked with students in the past, like young, especially younger kids where, like, literally they're, the ball's barely left the face and they're looking at that thing. Yeah. Like, um, to me, that that's not good learning. Um, yeah. Because... Uh, and so I've done that in the past. I've just put a towel over the thing so that the screen is blocked and they can, uh, it's still there measuring. And I got my computer so I can see it on my end. So right. see if we're moving in the right direction. But as you're practicing, 
take that away. So yeah, that's one of the great drills we do with our kids. And you know, get in the simulation and you know, hit shots, and then you you turn off the screen. Yeah. Okay, tell us what it did. Yeah. You know, or what'd you feel? Well, tell us what it did. And yeah. it's it's amazing how many of them kind of at first struggle with that, and then yeah. after a while they start to really kind of get into the learning side of that yeah. things and, and kind of yeah. you know have that awareness of what their path, what their face yeah. is doing. And when I was a kid, we used to play till dark and. You know, those last couple of holes, you're like, I feel like it went left. So you walk up the left side. <laughs> yeah. And you had to get really yeah. good at that. Yeah. You didn't find your ball. <laughs> exactly. And you couldn't you're, finish. You didn't yeah. have glow balls back in my day. They were walking in. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Any questions coming yeah. in there? Um, yeah, we do have one more. Okay. Uh, do you ever test speed stick versus club in hand? What are the results? Um, I mean, I, I, I haven't done that directly. Um, but I know that, I mean, we've t I've talked quite a bit to the speed stick people, and I know that their drills are kind of generic because they have to be. Um, but I think you could use a ground reaction force plate to really dial in your yeah. specific drills, right? So doing like a step drill for a horizontal player or doing a different drill for a vertical player, I think, is, is something that I think, I mean, they're great tools. I know I've seen speed go up um, yeah, when using them with a lot of people. And, and uh, but it's just I think it could as you start integrating the tools. I mean they've done a great job integrating those programs, but without a swing cap plate or without a kinematic right. measurement system, they're just generic, which is yeah. fine. I mean you yeah. have to start somewhere. Um, but I think you could really dial it in. So for these guys, I, I mean I wouldn't want a step drill in their training program for right. because that would train them to go more horizontal. Is what I'm trying to get rid of. Yeah. And so if they just go and do the generic speed stick training program, they may slow down with their real club in hand because. Mm -hmm you're creating speed in a way that I don't think they need it, or you're creating ground reaction force in a way. So I think using the tools together, you could pick and choose out of their database of better drills to, to guide people. So it's a great tool. I just think, uh, you know, and I've, we've, we've worked with them. We've talked to them quite a bit, and I think there, there's a lot of potential to kind of use it all together to really dial in the program for each person. And, and, and that's the, the, the take home message of the whole thing is you can't give everyone the same drill. Yeah, um, I know we did a case study last year. We started this with all of our players and it's still ongoing. So the, uh, the, uh, the information is inconclusive at this point, but we'll definitely get that out there because right. we definitely see some changes, especially as they go from speed sticks to club in hand. However, again, we're using the swing cat and measuring some of those you know, things happening. Yeah. Uh, it's been very interesting. So we'll, we'll get that information right. to you and kind of. Yeah, and imagine if you go down the wrong path. Like if these kids started doing the step drills or the horizontal drills, their pass would get way inside. Yeah, so they yeah. may, speed may go up, but then when their pass start going that way and the ball starts going everywhere, yeah. then your brain starts shutting down the speed because it needs to try to find it first. Yeah, so, that's right. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff to learn. Great tool, but I think, uh, you know, using some of the more technology yeah. to, to dial in the training programs where they could, could really make it even more effective. Yeah. Well, well, Dennis, from an assessment standpoint, I mean, you, you do some assessments with the players on, on all of this, right? And about four times a year, yeah. you're actually doing assessments here, you know, on the, on the Junior Academy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we do a full physical screen, you know, from FMS to golf specific screens and, and capture them on swing cat gears, obviously get path face, do a gapping. So it's, uh, you know, we try to connect the dots, you know, through our five elements. And as Scott was talking about, it's important to really understand it, I think, holistically rather than you know, just kind of attacking one specific uh, number. So, uh, yeah, really important to do that, I think. And I think what excites me about that is how you do it over time. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to have kids here for multiple years. We're going to have multiple times over multiple years. And as yeah. they grow and as things change, um, that's data that I'm pretty sure is not anywhere. I've never yeah. seen it. I mean, maybe some club company has it somewhere and they're hidden in their archives <laughs> or whatever. But uh, I've never seen any data like that. And that's what yeah. we really got to start to understand. Um, yeah. Because it's going to be a cluster analysis problem. We're going to have to figure out who, when they grow this much, needs to do this, and who, when they grow that much, needs yeah. to do that. Like, it's not going to be an easy fix. I guarantee yeah. it. When you're dealing with humans, it never is. Right. Um, and that's why you need a lot of data to answer those yeah. questions. Yeah. I mean, it's been really interesting. We did a research study with uh, uh, Columbia, mm -hmm. and they came in and were looking at our assessments and then looking at our player trajectory, what we call our player development index, and how that coincides with as our index number goes up. How their their performance actually improves, their right. score goes down, right? right. So they're they're scoring, uh, which is really interesting to see, as these kids, for example, are going through so many different uh, maturation, you know, cycles, if you will, regression, progression, and how that happens. So timeline is is really such a huge factor for us in understanding that. But you know, that's why measuring those things really make a lot of you know a lot of sense for us. Yeah, and and to me, you learn a lot in science by failure. I yeah. mean, that's the way you learn. So if there is a kid who's going up on your player development issue and then has a crash, yeah. that's the kind of data we want to see. And if we follow them all along and we can understand why that crash happened, 
yeah. and you can prevent the next one. So right. yeah. um, to me, failure is the best way to learn. It sucks for the kid, but yeah. I would love to have my ground reaction force data from when I was hitting my little baby draws and shooting 75 to my snap hooks and shooting 95. Yeah. Because that would give me ammo to, because no one could help me. They kept yeah. uh, weakening my grip and the ball kept it was coming back at me at one point, yeah. I think. Yeah. You, you weren't getting ready for that uh, college recruiting time, were you? I was. And then when <laughs> I we see shooting, that. That's one of the things we yeah. see a lot in our players. Yeah. You know, that, that junior, sophomore, junior player, and they, they get to this level and all of a sudden that recruiting time happens and we see a huge, you know, dramatic dip in their performance. And, yeah. you know, obviously hard to measure kind of what's in the brain right now, you know? Sure. So. And at that point, I, you just don't have the mental capacity to deal with. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I, I had All no idea pressures. why the ball was doing what it was doing. And so it was like a helpless feeling. And, yeah. and when you're 13, you know, you don't have the, you can't just say, okay, calm down. We're going to figure this out. Like, <laughs> There, there were some tantrums. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can get pretty excited about those things, right? Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, and, and it's, it's, I mean, luckily I didn't quit the game, but it, I mean, I could see a lot of people that do, that would at that point. So yeah. our job is to keep them in this game. Uh, and, and I mean, as much as it's great to have a college golf scholarship to create somebody who loves the game and plays it their whole life is, yeah. is probably the better goal. So absolutely. And that's, that's our goal anyway. Right. You know, we want kids to enjoy the game for life. It's right. Like, Great sport for life, and all of our players obviously want to stay healthy and play more. So that's, yeah. that's really cool. Awesome. Check out yeah. any final questions there, Michael. Um, that was the last one. That was the last okay. one. What awesome. time are we at? Is it noon yet? Yeah, yeah. We're a little past, yeah, a little past noon. Uh, all, right. Way into lunch by now. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, yeah, guys. Yeah, thank yeah, yeah. Dr. Lynn. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Scott, thanks for having yeah. us. Hope uh, I'm sure the viewers got a lot of value out of that. Really appreciate yeah. it, and uh, look forward to you know doing some research and getting some more uh, information out there. Awesome. So hopefully yeah. next year we'll have some more good stuff for you. You got it. All right. Thanks. Thanks, thank guys. You.